Hello and good time zone, everybody. Welcome to Horde of Tales for another round of Creator Talks. My name is Marcus, pronouns are he, him, and today I am joined by Neil from Fey Earth, a TTRPG set in an alternative universe, 19th century Europe, which is currently kickstarting. I'm happy to have Neil here today to not just talk about Fey Earth, but also a little bit about himself, his history with tabletop RPGs, and um, maybe we get even into talking what's the coolest and and most interesting fairy tale creature. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, but with all that being said, let's uh, give our guest Neil a chance to introduce himself. Welcome to the show, Neil. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, folks. So I'm Neil. My pronouns are he, him. I am my day job. I'm a secondary school teacher in Dublin. Um, I teach mathematics and science. Um, and then one of my one of my all consuming hobbies is tabletop role playing games. Um, so yeah, and for the last seven years, I have been writing and developing Fey Earth, my own baby project, my Magnus Opus. Um, as Marcus said, it's a indie TTRPG set in an alternate 19th century Earth where all the creatures from folklore and fairy tale are real, have always been real, and live alongside humanity. So it's a really fun setting in which you've got a mixture of the late 19th century industrial revolution happening in a world where magic is real and has always been real, and where you have the influences of magic in human society and the influences of the presence of the fae in human society. Quite the quite the blend of elements and themes there. And we're definitely going to spend some time today <laughs> talking about that. But before we get into that, Neil, you one does not simply start creating your own TTRPG. I think there is always a prequel to that story. And I'm curious, how did you get into tabletop RPGs and eventually make that decision of, yeah, I'm going to create my own game? So my introduction into teacher RPGs um, was in the 90s because I am quite old and um, I was 10 years old I think about that and my best friend in school was like hey Neil my cousins told me about this really cool game where we get to play wizards and fight dragons it's called Dungeons and Dragons we should play it you'll love it and like I was I, I was always a massive history and fantasy nerd I mean you have to understand like like I guess I'm blessed being Irish because, you know, growing up in Ireland in primary school, we learn about the mythology of the ancient Irish. Like we're learning about the stories of Cúchulainn, uh, Oisín and Tiernan Og, the children of Lyra. That's like on the curriculum is learning these beautiful, amazing myths, which most countries don't have, you know? I mean, that's just a simple fact, you know? Um, so... I always loved that, um, loved fantasy. When I was growing up as a child, I'd read all of the ancient Greek myths, you know, um, like at by 10 years of age, I could tell you in depth about the trials of Perseus and Theseus and all of that. So 10 years of age, massive mythology and fantasy nerd and my best friend start, introduced me to second edition Dungeons and Dragons and uh, played that for about five years, uh, loved it. But when I got to about 15 years of age, I decided to stop playing it because I'd realized that I had nothing in common with any of my friends, any of my peers and classmates in school. Like I had friends that I got on with, but like when we'd be talking about stuff, I couldn't really engage in the conversations because uh, my entire life was just obsessed with D&D. &D. Um, nice. so, so, so I stopped playing Dungeons and Dragons and I got more into playing rugby and music and just a common interest of a of a, an adolescent, you know, and actually stopped gaming then for a good 20 years. <laughs> like it was hmm. quite the break. And then in my early mid thirties, I just one day kind of realized that like, I didn't really have any friends anymore. You know how it happens that you you're in your twenties and you're all your friends are like people that you're friends with in university and likes, or maybe in sports clubs or something. And then you get into your late twenties, early thirties, and you're getting into jobs and careers and, people are moving cities and people are getting married and just life gets in the way, you know? And that was what had happened to me. Like that same best friend of mine. Um, it was really funny. And um, when my wife and I got married there 10 years ago, he, him and his wife, a house on the opposite side of the village in Dublin, 
that we were in. Dublin is a city made of villages. And like it was a five minute walk from my house to his house. And we just moved in about three months. And I was like, this is brilliant. This is like my best friend. He's like a brother to me. Um, this is going to be amazing. We're going to grow all together. His friends are going to be best. His kids are going to be best friends with my kids. And then he, he comes up to me one day. He's like, Neil, I've got some really bad news. We're moving to Cork, which is at the second city of Dub- of Ireland in the south. Like it's over two hundred kilometers south of Dublin. I've gotten a job. Um, he's a he's a pathologist, a very intelligent guy. I was like, I got it. We're moving. I was like, are you kidding me? Seriously, like. So so as I said, I'm in my mid thirties, and I'm like, I don't have any friends. All of like just my friendship group has disappeared because life got into way of it. And I was like, I really need to make an effort to actively reconnect with people and form social circles again so i i decided i know um i'd um i'd started watching this really fun um actual play on the geek and sundry youtube channel so any gen z people will not have no idea what i'm talking about right now this was the early days of the internet this was the before time okay when the ancient laws were being written okay so um but this really fun actual play that was being run by will wheaton um and his son was in it and actually laura bailey of critical role fame she was also one of the cast members and it was a cyberpunk game called um titan's grave based off of a set of mechanics that had just been published by green run and publishing called uh, fantasy age and um really really great series they only had one season and then stuff happened and then the company basically tried to screw over wheaton and he actually brought him to court and won over it um so I got into that, and then I got into Critical Role, like, pretty much from the start. Like, I think I started watching it a month after I started streaming on Geek & Sundry. So that had got me back into, oh, God, like, gaming is good. So I said, I know, why don't I run a game? I'll run this Titan Trade thing. So that, I was like, if I if I start running a game, then my friends and I were kind of like, as you have to do in your 30s, we're forced to meet up and socialize, you know? The gaming was that um was just that platform to force me and my friends to meet up. And that was that got me back into gaming. And I I ran that campaign for about a year and a half or something, and then eventually um that finished. And um and um I really enjoyed it, but I wanted to do something different. And shortly after I'd finished running that campaign, one day this idea popped into my head. What would it be like if all of the creatures from folklore and fairy tale had always been real and always lived alongside humanity. How would that have changed human history? And what would the world look like in such a universe? It was just a simple what if question that popped into my brain. And after a couple of days, the, it's, the question still hadn't gone away. I was like, this is a really cool idea. This would make a really great story. This would make a really great game. And I was like, I have to turn this into a game. I need to write something down and I need to make something from this idea or it's going to drive me insane because it just won't go away. And I've never had that before. An idea pop into my brain. It just won't leave, you know? And that was basically how Fey Earth was born. A An idea that didn't want to leave your mind, had to be put to paper, had to be mm-hmm. turned into a game. Yeah. Um Funny you mentioned the, that that path that you took from go basically learning about tabletop RPGs in your teenage years, then dropping out of it for a long time, and then later as an adult getting back to it. I think there is quite a few people out there who have very similar experiences. Like sometimes you meet these hobbies for the first time when you're younger, then life happens and you lose them for a bit, and then you come back and you realize, oh wow, this is really still a super fun hobby to uh, to be in. And for you, it also gave you the start of um, creating your own game, which we now know as Fey Earth. And as you already earlier mentioned in the conversation, it is an alternative universe, Earth, our world. In the 19th century, we have the Industrial Revolution, a complete grand change in society, in economy, um, in technology, happening in a world where creatures and entities from fairy tales and folklore have always been part of the world Mm. where that big dark forest at the edge of the village actually did have a big bad wolf Mm. or uh there has there have been fey spirits dancing at their mushroom circles and the lives all part of that 
all part of that world. Um, that idea is in your mind. It doesn't want to leave it. And you put it down on paper. And how did you go about it in the start? How did you, um, how did you put your very first draft of Fey Earth out of your mind um, so that that thought would no longer bug you? Um, and to the table as a first draft, how did that go? So when the idea came into my head, I was like, okay, I'm going to turn this into a game. And my first instinct was, I'm going to make it a, a D and D module for five E because I'd been playing a bit of five E at that stage. Um, through watching critical role, I had become extremely familiar with the mechanics of five E. As I said, my introduction to gaming was second edition, which honestly people go on about it being complicated. It wasn't complicated. Thacko is not complicated. It's subtraction. You learn it when you're seven years of age. It's really not that hard. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a maths teacher. But the point is, I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll make it into a 5e module because it's the game I play. I love it. I've, I've kind of grown not to like 5e so much anymore. I know that's very controversial, but not in the indie TTRPG scene at all. <laughs> um, but um, but I immediately realized, okay, this won't work. I can't make this setting for 5e. It's impossible because... Gary Gygax in the 1970s basically got his hands on a book of European mythology and folklore and basically culturally appropriated our entire folklore. I mean, call it what it is. He just look, took all these names of all these different creatures from folklore and just took the names to put in his game without making any attempt whatsoever to make these creatures appear as they did in their original stories. So I couldn't make Fey Earth a 5e module because you know 5e already has kobolds and hobgoblins and elves and fairies you know and all of these creatures in their game that are nothing at all like what they were like in the original folklore and the whole thing for me what i wanted in making this game was i wanted to create a game in which it was authentic to the folklore in which all of these magical creatures were portrayed as they were described in the original stories that were told by our ancestors. That was what was so important to me. And yet again, being Irish, and I was like, you know, I was I, uh, practicing neo pagan, well, laps practicing neo pagan, who grew up with a love of mythology in a country with some of the richest folklore in Europe, which it is. Um, I was like, I, I folklore is very important to me. So I was like, okay this can't be 5e, I was like, will I start looking at other systems? I was like, well, maybe Pathfinder. I was like, no, it's, I'll have the same problem. No matter what system I pick, so many of these names, you know, Goblin is a fairly ubiquitous name in all fantasy or in all tabletop. But when you read stories in which they describe goblins, from European folklore, they were not green-skinned, befined creatures living in caves eating man flesh. Quite the contrary. They were normally described as being very elderly um, men, like tiny little creatures, 30, 40 centimeters tall, long, stooped, flowing white beards, maybe a funny peaked hat and a hunch, or, maybe, or else described as very youthful and cherubic, who were extremely magically powerful and quite mischievous and very intelligent and cunning. You're not the goblins we think of, you know? So I was like, no, no matter what system I pick, I'll have this same problem. I need to make my own system. And that, so I basically started doing that. I suppose when it came to the actual creation of the system itself, the first thing I thought of was, okay, what will my classes be? What can you be in this game? Because if I, if I, if I know what you as the player can play, that will that will help me better understand what mechanics I need for you to be able to do what you're going to do as that profession, as I called it in my system or class, as it's called in other right. systems. Yeah, And so that was it. And then, so I originally came up with some basics. I was like, okay, it's a 19th century world. We're going to have fighters because it's the most basic class and I love fighters. Okay, it's a 19th century world. So I'm going to have a gunslinger because guns are a thing and have been a thing for a long time. And guns are no longer crap. You know, by the 19th century, in fact, that was like my background. Um, I've been, I've, I've actually been, I fence as well and have for, done for about 20 years now. Um, 
not uh, Olympic fencing. I do historical European martial arts. Um, so long sword, sword and buckler. So, but the, and I did years of historical reenactment as well. And you being from the Netherlands, you'd be f familiar with people dressing up in Viking festivals and stuff. So I did that for a long time. So, so I'm very knowledgeable in um, historical weapons and specifically swords. Okay. So I know a little bit about guns, not much. So when I started with, well, looking at fire, I was then researching firearm technology and it's terrifying when you look at what a gun in the year 1830 could do versus 1860. It is truly terrifying the leaps that occurred in firearms technology. Like, it's so scary. You know, they went from these really crap things that were accurate to about maybe 15 meters with a really crap reloading time to they start, they, bring, they introduce rifling technology. And now this thing is accurate to over a hundred meters, has about four times the velocity and holds a cartridge of eight to 10 bullets. I'm like, seriously, it's just terrible. So, but so I was like, okay, so I need to have a gunslinger. You can't have a 19th century setting without people using guns. And then I was like, okay, well, I'll need them my spell casters. In what way is magic the same? In what way is it different? And I was like, well, the way I looked at it was, okay, I didn't have a thing of like, say, in the classic five year, you have your divine magic and your arcane magic, and they come in different sources. Like, no, magic is magic. No one knows where magic comes from. Everybody has their theories. So, priests of the churches will say, magic is a gift that comes from the gods or maybe our ancestral spirits. Okay. The druids will say, magic comes from nature. Witches say magic is in, is in everything around us, and we can use the physical things around us to unlock that essence. And sorcerers, the, who are the academics of my of my class, like magic is a science, and you study it like you study mathematics or physics to understand its forces. Okay, um, so they all have their theories on how magic works, and they all approach it differently. But no one actually knows where magic comes from, um, and they all have access to many, but not all of the same spells. Okay, so then I was like, okay, so these will be the different types of magic users that I have. So I'll have my sorcerers who are the academics. If you're from a wealthy middle or upper class family where your family can afford to it, you'll go to university to study magic and you study it as a science. You, you're learning almost like mathematical formula. If you're from, right. a per, if you're from a poorer family background and you, and you realize your child was born with the arcane spark, you might go to the local church or monastery and tell the local priest, our child has the gift of magic. Because if you're from a poor family, you can get your child into the religious orders that's one less mouth to feed and you know your child is going to live a good life, you know? So right. so, so that then influenced how my magic system was going to work. Um, and it just organically then grew from there, really. For, from what you're telling here, I mean, there's a lot of, from the way that you explain things, there, I, I get the idea that you're approaching this very much from a um, setting first approach. Like you're thinking like, what kind of elements in the game would I have based on the setting I'm trying to go for? I mean, yeah. you're talking about, yes, of course, I want to have a gunslinger because I want to show that guns were a thing in the 19th century. But on the other hand, you're also saying that spellcasters um, just approach magic, this magic, which is the same thing to all of them, but from different angles in different ways, which mm. says a lot about the setting already. Mm. Um, and regarding that setting, um, you mentioned a lot of things where you want to look for the the realism in the setting. Like you mentioned that from your background in uh, in, um, in medieval uh, martial arts um, and your knowledge in that, you want to give a bit of a realistic impression of what was what was realistic at the time. Mm. But you are, of course, also um, combining this with fantastical elements, which is one of in my opinion, personally, in my opinion, when I look at the setting, uh, one of the really interesting factors about a setting we have the we have the 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 mundane of the history that we know now blended with the supernatural, with the fantastical. Um, how did this the mixing of these two elements, trying to trying to give a grounded and realistic version of the nineteenth century while also adding fantastical elements, how does that work out in play? and at the table well i suppose start first of all in terms of the creation of the world how i dealt with it was largely through the mundane um if magic is real how does that affect the average person in their day-to-day -day life what kind of things will you have 
So you'll have artificers making magic items. Okay, well, what kind of items would an artificer make? They'll make enchanted needles for dressmakers. You know, they'll make little fairy globes um, for lighting a house. Or I don't know, it was my goblin spark, which is basically a magic Zippo lighter for your pipe, you know? <laughs> so you've, you, you know, so you've got all these everyday mundane things which are bringing elements of magic into it. Like one thing I describe about in, in the world of Fair Earth is that the oceans of Fair Earth are teeming with whales. And the reason for this is because all of the major cities of Europe, they light their streets with enchanted fairy globes. Whereas in the 19th century, how they used to light the street lamps was with whale oil. But if, if, you, have, if you have these enchanted fairy globes, you don't need to hunt the whales for the oil. Yeah. So now... That's a good point. So, so, so in Fey Earth, this, the oceans are teeming with whales because they were not something that was being hunted out of necessity. That's an interesting point you raised there, how this kind of the, how that fantastical influences the mundane yeah. in that way. That that's interesting. And, and, and then from, from the, for the player's perspective, it just makes the world more realistic. Right. It, re, it just makes it seem more real, you know, because it's, it's not that we're looking at dragons flying over city skies or fantastical animals like that. You're like, no, okay, this, Oh, I I can buy this enchanted comb, and when I brush it through my hair, my all the wrinkles in my clothes disappear, and I'm clean. And like really, these mundane like that brings the magic to life, you know. And then and and so the, in having those mundane elements in the setting, then for the player when they start um, interacting with that world, it just naturally they just naturally fall into the world um, that has this mixture of industrialization and magic like so another thing like you have in, in, like the artificers as well as making objects for the everyday people are also working with capitalists and industrialists and they're making arcane magically empowered pistons and engines for factories so they're using these arcane engines instead of coal powered pistons and engines you know and stuff like that so you've got those elements coming into it too um um which then brings in a whole social class into your setting of these people who are really important and making a ton of money because they're providing an essential service to the industrialists who are making a ton of money. If there ever will be a comb that I can just put for <laughs> my hair and it also takes out all the wrinkles in my yeah. clothing, I would get me one of those, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so you do mention the, the impact that the fantastical elements, the presence of these magical creatures and powers can have on the industrial part of the setting, which makes sense because you did mention this is at a time of an industrial revolution. This is at a time where change is sweeping the world. Um, and it sounds very plausible to also use these fantastical animals and that. But in the place of Fey Earth, are there also places where this industrial revolution is fields further away are there places out there in the world where for example the fantastical elements the 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 fairy creatures themselves is there are there these more distant places where this industrial revolution is uh, revolution is further away well in the setting itself there's um the geography of europe is slightly different there are two fey nations that exist in the world okay and the first one called Arcadia, it's basically made up of the Alsace region of France, of the city of Strasbourg, um, uh, coming into the Black Forest region of Germany, about half of Switzerland and the Austrian Alps. So that, mm. that bit between France and Germany, you know, and um, that's one of the Fey nations, okay, of Arcadia. And it's mostly, um, so it, the, the Black Forest is a lot bigger in Fey Earth because there's people not chopping it down. And um, and so, uh, and then the other Fey nation in Europe is Jotunheim, which is basically the northern Arctic region of uh, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. So that entire northern region is Jotunheim, okay? And so in Jotunheim, you've got your frost giants, your trolls, dwarves, huldra, elves. Um, you also have the Sami people. They get on great with the Fey. Um, they get on so well with the Fey. Um, and then in Arcadia, it's dwarves, but think more Rumpelstiltskin um, than Lord of the Rings. And elves and centaurs and dryads and moist and 
kobolds and so forth. Okay, so in the two Fey nations, they haven't embraced industrialization, but you know they say uh, mother or necessity is a mother of invention. These are two nations filled with incredibly powerful magical creatures that use magic. It's part of their being, so they don't they haven't needed industry in the way humans have adopted and embraced industry, you know? Um, but at the same time, in the setting, there's talk of how, like, okay, the Fae have, they're now getting interested in the sciences and industry stuff the humans are looking at. They're looking at, okay, well, how could we incorporate that and use it as well? But so in those two nations, it's still very much, they are very magical. Um, right. And then I suppose just as happened in Europe, um industry happened in the cities and in the large towns so once you leave the cities and the large towns and you're into rural areas you're naturally going to find more fake creatures living in those areas in those environments and as a consequence you'll find more people you go practicing much older traditions um they're carrying around little charms and tokens and amulets to protect them from the fae and from like the evil eye and stuff like that so you get that uh, 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 that aspect of it as well um where people are being a bit more traditional in their outlook to life you know um, there might not necessarily be any magic in the community because in the world of fair magic is extremely rare um there's two playable lineages in the game there's your standard boring human human and then you have the Fae Touched, who are also humans, but somewhere in your ancestry, someone had sex with a fairy or something, okay? Basically. And that Fae blood passed through the family line, okay? Um, now, the Fae Touched are all born with the arcane spark. They're all born with the ability to use magic, but most of them don't become massively powerful sorcerers and mystics because they're too busy trying to feed their families. So they'll learn a couple of cantrips, but they're, they didn't, you know... They didn't have time to go or, or the money to go to university or anything like that and study the arcane. They were busy getting jobs and living real lives. So they'll have some simple magic and have some simple cantrips that they use in their day to day. But that's it, you know. Um, and then the non fabled humans, a, a, a percentage of them are born with the arcane spark, but it is really rare. And it's something that like is mentioned in the setting. Although this first book. The core rule book and our Kickstarter is set in Europe. The the hope is that after this Kickstarter, when once it's successful and I've published Fey Earth, um, in the, uh, in the next year or two, I will be starting Kickstarters on expansions of the setting. The first one being an Africa expansion, and then going on to probably the Americas and so forth. But um, they are briefly mentioned in the game, and one of the things that's mentioned is that while magic is still much rarer in human communities where nobody has fey blood um it's less rare but still rare in other parts of the world than it is in europe in europe it's like basically what happened is about 200 250 300 years ago people noticed that less people were being born with the arcane spark it was about the same time that um, the churches went around and you know persecuted about a hundred thousand people calling them witches So, yeah, that didn't happen really anywhere else in the world, except mm. in Europe. And as a consequence, Europe has less people with magic now than it used to. So there is there is still in the setting from what what you also, what you also tell, not just only is the magical elements coming back in the industry, but since you also mentioned there's like, a, at least on the European continent, two nations of yeah. Fey, yeah. Uh, uh, of Fey origin, um, and also the smaller villages that are out uh, that still stick to their own traditions. Um, so there is a lot of fantastical places also to mm. go to, um, which sounds to me, even if you're just in the current iteration of Fey Earth focusing on Europe, there's a lot of interesting places to have adventures in for your for your party, which mm. does lead me to my next question we've been talking a lot so far about the setting and i think there's a lot in it to talk about um let's talk about the system because you did mention you did draw pretty early on the conclusion you can't base it on like 5e or any other D, D adjacent system 
you had to make your own system. And so you started making your own system. And yes. what what did that turn into? What what's the system? What's the engine beneath the uh, beneath the hood of the car that is Fey Earth? If it was so, a car, which it isn't. Um, please go. Uh, well, it is a D20 system. And the reason it's a D20 system is for two reasons. One, at the time I started writing Fey Earth, D20 was the system I was by far the most familiar with. I had played Fantasy Age, which is a 3D6 system, but D20 was the system I was most familiar with. It's what I'd started gaming in and I'd returned to gaming in, okay? There was also the simple fact from a very cynical perspective that the reality is easily 90% of the TTRPG community and market is made up of people who play and exclusively or almost exclusively play 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, okay? Like, that's just the reality. We know this for a fact. That's how much D&D dominates this hobby so if i wanted people to play my game they were going to be either from that tiny tiny sliver of 10 percent of the community that plays other games or they're going to be somebody who's played at least some dnd so i said okay i'm going to use a make it a d20 system so that all the dnd players who come into it because the most common argument dnd players make for not learning or playing other games is i don't have time to learn a new system like bitch please you just spent six months learning a ridiculously complicated system d 5e is not an easy system at all it's and i'm saying this as a maths teacher as an educator who works every day with teenagers who struggle with maths and numeracy that it's a terrible system from a maths perspective okay um, this isn't even getting into what you think about it as a TTRPG game or setting around like, no, as a maths educator, I can say now, I really hate 5e for its unnecessary complexity, you know, um, if you're trying to introduce people to the hobby, I would not start with that system, you know, but, uh, but I was like, okay, it's going to have to be D20, but I'm going to streamline it. It's going to be simple. Okay. And it is, I'm very proud to say a very, very simple system. I was at an amazing convention there two weeks ago in the West of Ireland at VentureCon, like a phenomenal, con probably the best con I've ever been to in Ireland. Two day convention. They ran over 80 games it, using 37 different systems. Only 35% of the games were 5e. It was incredible weekend. Unbelievable weekend. I had a lot of fun. I was very busy. I ran four games and it was on two panels because I'm a head case, but it was brilliant. And I had, like, well, I ran a game of Fey Hearth and I, of the five people at my table, four of them were complete beginners. I said, we've never played a TTRPG in our life. We play board games. This is our first time ever playing a TTRPG. Two of them were kids. One looked to be about maybe 10 and the other was 12. They were able to pick up the game, had no problem playing it, the, the, the 12 year old girl she's playing a spellcaster no problem at all has never played a ttrpg in her life and she's playing a spellcaster i was like yeah this is like yeah it is a so that so the system is very 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 simple it works a very very simple premise there's eight abilities in the game fortitude which is like a mixture of both your strength and constitution dexterity awareness intellect which is like your intelligence but also and a measure of your uh, level of education resolve which is just your willpower uh, charm and then you have a fighting ability score and a magic ability score. Every time you want to do something in the game, you are rolling for an ability check. That's it. Your number, the number that you have assigned associated with an ability is your modifier. So if I'm really strong, I have a fortitude of three or four. And I'm adding four to the roll. And then you've got other skills and talents. So I might have, say, the hardiness talent or the willpower talent or something like that. And then you've got skills. So I might have something like failure or parrying or whatever it is. So then it's like, literally, you roll your D20, you add your ability score, and then add any other modifiers you have for any other skills or talents that would be relevant to the thing you're trying to do. And then that's it. You just got to beat the target number. So it's a really, really, really simple system. Um, but I'm quite proud of it, um, both because I feel I've done a very good job designing a system that's very, very easy to pick up, very quick and easy system to pick up. It's not complicated. Everything is the same role every time, but also it's quite dynamic. Um, when it comes to uh, combat, I was, I robbed slash was inspired by Pathfinder's three action rule that they have for second edition. So I have a similar thing where you, in, in, in the game, you have a major action and two minor actions. 
your major action is your like action action i attack like ash spell or whatever your minor action is for things like moving maybe reloading your gun sheathing a, a weapon and drawing a weapon okay um and those kinds of things but you also can use react um, your minor actions for reactions so what that means is if you're doing something in combat but you're not moving you have an unspent minor action that you can now spend on something else so let's say you're a fighter mm -hmm. um uh, let's say you're playing a fighter who is a former soldier and you use a saber and you learn the parrying skill and you're locked in combat engaged toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody you're not moving around you've got this unspent minor action You've taken your turn, use your major action, they go to attack you, you have this unspent minor action, oh, I'm going to spend my minor action to parry their attack, you know? And and so it creates this whole other level of choice in what you can do in combat. It brings a whole other dimension into the game. That's an interesting tactical choice you can get to make then, because yeah. on your turn, you have to decide, am I going to use my minor actions already on my turn, mm. or do I keep maybe one of it like in my back pocket yeah. in case I need to respond to something that happens down the line. Yeah. And then certain classes will have reactions, like say the sorcerers have dispelled magic to counter spells and magical effects of fake creatures, you know. Um, uh, the, the mystics or the cursor class, they can bless people, you know, so, um, stuff like that, you know. The, and I've, another thing I have in the game, and this is something I'm very proud of, this is a mechanic that's unique to Fey Earth, Loosely inspired video stuff, but I do genuinely feel like this is my own idea. I've not seen any other system that has this. I have a thing called feats. Not a unique name, but feats nonetheless. Um, and feats are special moves that you train in that you can use to augment your major action. So they're broken down loosely. There's three main types of feats. Combat feats, um, um, spell feats, and social feats. Okay? Um so the combat feats might be things like, say, Mighty Blow, where you're rolling an extra damage die, maybe a quick attack, or, you know, so um, a disarming blow, a faint, so stuff like that. So the idea being that when you want to use a feat, a feat costs a minor action, and a feat has a feat point cost associated with it. So the more powerful the feat, the more complex the move, the higher the point cost. And in order for your feat to succeed, you must beat the target number that you're trying to hit by an amount equal to or greater than the, the feet point cost. So if I'm a fighter and I'm attacking with my saber and I say, okay, I want to do a quick attack. So I get an extra attack. I say, okay, that's that's a feet point cost of four. And the creature that I'm attacking has a defense of 16. Uh, if I want to land my hit, I need to get my 16. As long as I get a 16 or higher, my major action attack lands same as normal. But if I get 16 plus four, 20 or higher from my final roll, my minor feat activates and then I get to use that. And in this case use, oh, I get to do a second attack. So then, so it's a whole other thing that you get now. And now with some of the, some of the classes, um, like say the fighter class, they get three levels of training in feats because it makes you become a really cool, like you're not just a fighter. You get to decide, well, what type of fighter am I? Am I a tactical fighter? Am I a defensive fighter? Am I somebody who's like just hits really, really hard and does a lot of damage? Am I somebody who can attack lots of people or, you know, stuff like that? And then the spell casters, they can also be augmenting their spells. Like they have like quick spells where you can extend the range of them or reduce the mana cost and stuff. Like that. So you really do get to customize if you want the type of character that you're playing. And that's something that I was also really felt strongly about was I wanted to make a, get a system that allowed you to have a high degree of customization in the type of right. character that you're playing. And I think that I've done that through the various different types of skills, but also this feat mechanic. Right. And with feat mechanic, you mentioned it is an interesting design space because you're giving the players options they can use when they're rolling well like if you're if, the, the, if you roll well on attacking a target okay cool i rolled really well but a hit is still a hit right yeah but with the system that you describe here that hit turns into a potential second attack or exposing a weakness and mm. something like that so there's a there's an extra good feeling to rolling well that you can also on top of that do something cool with that and it was what inspired me with the feat system was the idea that in the stories of old, how the heroes of the story would often have some special move that they were famous for, something that they could do with their sword or with their axe or whatever it was. And I was like, I want to make a mechanic 
that allows you to pick a special move and train in it. So that's the other thing that as you're going, as you're leveling up, you can take additional levels of training in your feet. So that lowers the cost. So right. you're, it's more likely that when you t attempt to use it, you will succeed. And obviously, as you're uh, sticking with the combat feats as the example, as you're going up a level, your attack modifiers are naturally going to increase as well. So when you get to like mid tier, you're consistently, if you're rolling average, you're probably going to be able to use the feat in most turns, you know? Unless you're fighting some really cool badass who's got a really feckin' high defense. In which case, <laughs> then it gets really fun and interesting because they're like, oh, I'm a badass. I hit everything. And then they meet this new guy and they're like, I rolled a 24. Well, you hit him, but your feet didn't activate. And then That's I, had gonna... a, I had a plus seven. It's like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> did I stutter? <laughs> That's going to uh, raise some flags and bring oh, yeah. some yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That sounds really interesting. Uh, thanks for highlighting that and also explaining uh, this interesting mechanic uh, in the game. So all of this, both the setting and the rules, that is currently kickstarting right now for Fey yes. Earth. The Kickstarter Absolutely. launched yesterday mm -hmm. and we are already at about 25% yeah. of the money yeah. that's being raised. That's for those great. who, it's fantastic. Um, with, for those who haven't checked out the Kickstarter yet, and if you haven't, make sure you check it out. Um, what is it, what's currently, what's gonna be included? What is it you're exactly kickstarting for Fey Earth at this point? What's the, what's the product that's getting kickstarted here? So this is to raise the money I need to publish the core rule book. It's as simple as that, okay? The reality is that uh, making a TTRPG, a book, it's expensive. And this is, this is a fully developed, complex system, easily on par with 5e Pathfinder, C Call of Cthulhu, World of Darkness. It's on par with any of them. The final core rule book will be at least 250, probably closer to 300 pages. It's going to be a big book. Now, it's only a single book, so you're not having to buy a player's book and then a GM's book and then a monster's manual. It's all one tome, okay? Um, so that's it. It's a single cost. But it is, it's it's expensive doing this, you know, um, especially because um, people who love TTRPGs also are quite demanding when it comes to things like art in their books. And art is expensive. And I refuse to use AI. I, AI art will never appear in my game ever. I refuse to use it and will always pay to support my artists. But that means you have to generate a lot of money for it. And that's what this money is going towards. It is to raise the funds that I need to pay the amazingly talented artists in our community to bring the book to life and then to pay the incredibly skilled editors and typesetters and formatters and all those other people and your printers and your publishers and your distributors to make this game. So that is what we're doing. This is all about creating the core rule book that now the thing is this core rule book will have everything you need. It'll do, it'll have the essentially your player's handbook, um, a GM's guide section, and a zoological compendium with stat blocks for all the creatures, as well as obviously information on the setting of Europe and the world and all the rest of that as well. So that's what is in the book. Um, so it's everything that you need to start running an adventure of uh, Fey Earth. And um, there's three tiers um, for the Kickstarter. The 20 euro tier, you get a digital PDF version of the rule book, okay? Everything you need, but in digital PDF. Uh, the 30 euro tier, you get that and a digital copy of a starter adventure that will get you and a party of players from levels one to five. Okay? So it's a really fun starter adventure um, that you can get properly get stuck in, not a one shot like a small mini campaign to get to levels one to five. And then at the 40 euro tier, you're getting the digital version of the core rule book and the starter adventure and then you get your physical hardback uh, copy of the core rule book and a gm screen so i mean it's i've done everything i can to try and make the tiers as reasonably priced as i possibly can um because i want people to be able to enjoy the game you know but also you mentioned clearly 
there is a lot of people and factors involved in creating a game. And yes. the clear, the clear, and really good choice of also supporting artists who create the art that brings yeah. the game to life. I think one of the import, one of the elements of a beautiful TTRPG book is also art that is evocative, that yeah. tells me, shows me what is this game about. But also uh, the people who do the layouting, the 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 writing, all of that. It of course it costs money. That's the truth, yeah. and it takes it takes that to make a product become reality. And the tiers you just described, that sounds especially getting a full-fledged adventure that gets you through the first few levels of the game. That's always yeah. a good, that's a good companion to a new game. I love it when I get a new game and there is an adventure that can get me started with it. So I'm like, okay, yeah. now I read the rule book. Let's play this and see yeah. uh, how it plays. Um, that sounds amazing. And I hope that more that all the people who watch this and even more come and support your Kickstarter uh, for that. And we're, however, slowly creeping up on the, uh, on the end of this conversation. However, um, I do have one final question for you, Neil. As you are considering your background in creating Fair Earth, you must be an expert on fairy tales and folklore creatures. Uh... And I wonder... If you could pick a single creature from folklore or fairy tales that you could be, like that you could be for a day or whenever you want to, oh. what kind of what kind of funny little critter or creature from folklore and fairy tales would you pick? What's like your what what's your choice here? That's that's really difficult. That is like especially for me. I have been I've been researching this for seven years. <laughs> Okay, and, and and when I say researching, my source material is academic books on folklore, academic papers on folklore, like translations of first editions of the Brothers Grimm, that level of 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 detail. So um my dear friend Polina, who's one of my artists, was joking that I could probably write a PhD. I don't I'm not on that level, but I probably could do a <laughs> master, certainly. But so this is a really difficult question. Um, I, I I think I might have to cheat and and give a few regional answers. Um, <laughs> well, well, I have consulted with the Fey Lords who control this conversation, and you're allowed to cheat on this. Okay, one. so if it was going to be from Irish folklore, it would have to be a puka, um, mischievous Fey that could um shape shift. Um, the funny thing is, we do not actually have in any of our stories regarding the puka. There is not a single story in which describes the puka in its true form. They were always described in one of the various animal forms that they take. Commonly a uh, black-haired, shaggy-coated uh, pony, um, a large black dog, sometimes a cat, sometimes a goat, okay? So they're only ever described in their animal forms, but they are shapeshifters and tricksters, okay? And um, if I was going for something... See, I mean... A goblin would be so much fun because they were so mischievous and so powerful magically um, that, you know, great. Um, kobolds, though, were actually really, really scary. Um, they're these, like, oh, cute domestic brownie-type creatures from Germany. But I remember one story I read about, um, I think it was from Dusseldorf, I'm not sure, of a kobold that lived in the manor house of some noble. And kobolds are always invisible. They, they're they always invisible. They never reveal themselves. But in the story, uh, a young serving boy in the noble's house tricked the kobold into breaking its invisibility and revealing itself. And the kobold became so enraged it ripped the lad's arm off and beat him to death with it. Yeah, that's not the kobolds I know from other fantasy. No, we, uh, this is, you see, when I, going back to what I said at the start of our conversation, why this was never going to work in 5e. <laughs> but if I was going to go for your your own mother country of the Netherlands, if I was looking at Dutch folklore, it would have to be a gnome. Uh, the um, what are they called? Uh, Kabouter. Um, I'm Kabouter. Kabouter. Yes. Kabouter. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, um, the Kabouter would have to be Kabouter. Yeah. Uh, um, because um, really fun magical elemental creatures, but also um able to communicate telepathically with any person they met regardless of the language the idea of being able to communicate with any person from any culture in any language would be amazing but but i suppose in answering your question i am showing off 
the level of detail I have done in my research in bringing this world to life in that there is no such thing as a generic fairy in Bayard. Uh, if you're in France, it's Lutien, you know, if you're in Ireland, it's the Ninema, you know, it's, and they are different um, because they are based on the stories from those countries. So right. it will, you will always, it feels different, you know, um, uh, when you are playing. And if you are playing in an adventure and your characters are getting to travel around to different regions and you, oh, we, this is a fair, oh, we met a fairy before back in, uh, in Cornwall. Yeah, but you're in Brittany now. These are a different type of fairy. You know, it's like, and it does create a lot of fun. Beautiful. There is something about these regional versions of fairy tales and folklore that at the same time show us how similar we are, but also how different yeah. we interpret certain things. And yeah. that is a, some, a, that's a beautiful takeaway from that. Neil, thank you so much for coming here for this conversation, for telling us about Fey Earth, for uh, sharing your fascination with the Fey, the folklore, and the fairy tales. And I hope and will be supporting the Kickstarter for Fey Earth. If you have been watching this and you want to support the Kickstarter, links to the Kickstarter are down below this video. And if you want to check out Neil on Fey Earth, you can check, uh, check him out on his Twitter socials? Are there any yeah. other socials where we can find I am um, Basically, I'm everywhere at Fey Earth. Everywhere. I, think on, I think on TikTok, I'm Fey underscore Earth, but on Twitter and Blue Sky, I'm at Fey Earth. Um, on YouTube, my VODs are at Fey Earth as well. On Twitch, I'm also Fey Earth. Yeah, so. Perfect. Yeah. So you can, you can find Neil everywhere there. Yeah. Once again, Neil, thank you very much for our conversation. We will be wrapping this up here for today. Uh, for today, this is this week, not the last time that you can see us here on Horror of Tales, because on Friday, mm. Darcy and Ida will kick off the Women in Gaming Month here on Horror of Tales, all month long content, TTRPG content for and by women and fun yes. identifying folks. Uh, you can find the schedule of what we have on there on our socials, and you can join our kickoff for that on Friday with Darcy and Ida. Yeah, that's going to be so great. I'm friends with them. Like, I'm friends with Kat at the Lore Mistress, um, who I know is going. And yeah. it's going to be so great. I'm so excited for it. It's fantastic it's gonna, to see. It's going to be fantastic. I'm yeah. looking very much forward to it. Neil, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, everyone, for checking out this creator talk. I wish everyone a great rest of your day, whatever time zone you're in or whatever time it is. Take care, stay safe, and see you soon on Horde of Tales. Bye.